I do hope you brought your Bible with you this morning. We are in Mark chapter 16. I'm going to read the first eight verses of the chapter. So as you're finding your place, Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. The story of the empty tomb. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified? He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Amen. This is God's word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Well, I have a couple of goals this morning in trying to unpack uh, this very short story with you. One, I hope that you have a similar response to the women at the tomb, that you would be struck with a trembling and astonishment that would produce in you a life of worship, Monday through Saturday, but then also with God's people on the Lord's Day, each Lord's Day, that worship would come to order the way that you live. And that our witness, secondly, that our witness would become very natural like we would rather talk about Jesus than anything else with the people that we love. So as we look at the, at the other characters in this story, um, Mary and Mary and Salome and Peter and Jesus himself, it is my hope this morning that we would want to go and tell. That we would... Living under the pardon we received, we would come to also live under its power. And that power would produce in us worship and witness as a way of living. So those are the goals. Uh, the final week of Christ's earthly ministry, the unraveling of the knot occurs on this day. It's really not the climax of the story. The climax is the point of highest tension in the story. That happened sometime earlier, probably around the transfiguration and is built around that tension of what kind of Messiah will he be? But at his resurrection, we have the solving of all of that problem. He is a spiritual Messiah. He's a, a, a king, a true king, but a spiritual king of a spiritual kingdom. And he does far more than defeat Rome. In his rising again, he defeats the true enemies. Our own flesh and sin, Satan, hell, and even that specter that haunts us all, death itself. He is a great king. Well, this final week of his earthly ministry from Palm Sunday to Resurrection Sunday receives more attention than any other week in his three years of ministry. Over half of John's, well, right at half of John's gospel, almost half of the gospel of Mark, and only slightly less in Matthew and Luke. These six to eight days, if you count it Sunday to Good Friday or Sunday to Sunday, and so they are worthy of our attention as well. Uh, even to step out of the regular course of preaching. We've been going through the Corinthian letters. We finished 1 Corinthians. We're not even halfway through 2 Corinthians yet. To take time in this week to step out of that and focus on this week of Christ's earthly ministry. It is worthy of that kind of attention. 
And so here we are in the conclusion of a four-part series beginning Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and now this morning. We want our walk with Christ to be informed by who He is and the things that He did, especially in that last week. There's something very um, moving about how this takes place. I think it's moving um, as I think about it, and I'm asking you to think about it with me. If you are going to deceive the world about a big matter, wouldn't you want to employ the help of what the culture would assume is the most trustworthy witness to that event? Well, I'm not advocating what I'm about to tell you. I'm just reporting facts, right? Many of you know this, right, that in the first century world, women did not hold a status as worthy witnesses. But who receives the word? Who is the apostle to the apostles? Again, God just turning things upside down. It ought to be encouraging to us. A second thing I want you to take away as, I, as you think about this with me. You've often heard it said that one of the proofs of the truth of the resurrection is the fact that the apostles were willing to die, right? For, for what they had, had been through. Well, with a little bit of thought, that one, that one doesn't ring as powerful as it might on first glance. If you give it a second glance, there are lots of religions in the world, false religions in the world, where human beings are willing to die for the things they believe in. But one thing that's common is that people are not willing to die for what they know is a lie. And that's where the weight falls in that observation. They had not concocted a plan. They were not trying to deceive anyone. In fact, I think Peter was content to go back to his blue-collar labor as a commercial fisherman. When he says in John's Gospel, they asked him, what's he going to do? He said, I'm going fishing. He wasn't saying I was going on vacation. I'm going to take some time down at the coast and I'm going to, going to relax and clear my head and see what I really think about all this after I catch some really big fish. No, he was saying the occupation I had before all this disciple, apostle stuff started, I'm going back to work. But then he met the risen Lord. It's an observation worthy of note. So, by way of introduction, that's our orientation to what we have here. We have the pivotal moment in which the women see the empty tomb. They do report it to the disciples. I know verse 8 says they didn't say anything to anyone. Well, they couldn't hold that for long. We know from the other Gospels that they did report to the apostles what they had seen. And Peter, those words. So, good orientation to what we're doing. First... And I've got four, four brief points, and the fourth one is my conclusion, so here we go. First, I want to observe the affectionate visit. When the Sabbath was passed, and this is talking about the seventh day of the week, right? This was the Jewish Sabbath. Um, it would be for us what we might consider to be Saturday. It is the end of the week. It had passed. So we're talking about 6 o'clock in the evening, thereabouts. These three women go and buy spices, this would have been done at a great expense to themselves. Their love for Christ, for Jesus, was compelling them to go into their personal treasury, into their personal wallets, and to do something very loving for Him. So it's worthy to note, this was not a custom to embalm the body, or even to preserve it in any way. Some of you may have heard that from other sources in the past. Uh, but they didn't embalm bodies in this day. Nor were they really overly concerned with preserving the body. It might have been out of, out of a care that the, as the decomposition of the body, of a normal, regular person, dead body, um, would have put off a pretty bad stench. It might have been to calm that some. But really, this was an act of showing care. They go and buy these spices so that they could go and anoint him. 
But John chapter 19 tells us that this wasn't necessary. This was not an anointing for his burial like Mary had done in another affectionate act when she poured out that bottle of ointment on him. And you remember how Judas complained? You know, it could have been sold for a year's wages, given to the poor. His heart was deceitfully wicked because he really wanted it to go into the money bag so he could take some for himself. But we're also told in John chapter 19 that two unsuspected followers of Christ had already cared for his body. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus of John chapter 3 fame, having come to him at night, right? Both of these men were religious leaders serving on the Sanhedrin. And they had heard Jesus preach. Nicodemus had that whole conversation with him. We're told that they were secretly following him, but they're not being secret about it anymore by the time they get to John 19. The Apostle John records for us that they bought over 75 pounds of spices and ointment. And they applied it to the body of Christ on the evening of his burial. They went into the tomb, cared for his body, made sure that he was laid out properly. It's an affectionate visit. These women are wanting to go above and beyond the call of duty here and do for Jesus a special act of worship and affection. Imagine their surprise when he wasn't there. I, I, there's no record of it, so I... I I'm, I feel pretty convinced it didn't happen, but maybe to some of us it might happen. You just spent all that money on those spices, and you get to the tomb and it's empty. How are we going to get our money back? <laughs> I, I doubt it even crossed their minds. They were so astonished, trembling. What does it all mean? Well, one thing that it means... Christ didn't need them to do this act of affection for him. In Acts chapter 17, verse 24, we read about God, the unneedy God, the God who made the heavens and the earth, and he has no need of of works done by human hands. When God created the world, he did not do so because he was lonely. He did not look out on the vast expanse of space and say, you know, I wish I had somebody to talk to. He was perfectly in fellowship with himself, whole and complete, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he had no need. Jonathan Edwards describes it this way, Well, because you might ask, well, why did he create then? And Jonathan Edwards has this beautiful image. He says, it is no fault of a fountain to overflow. For his own glory, all the world came into existence at the command of his word. And yet... He delights in our worship. So there the women were on the day of resurrection. Here we are on this day of celebrating the resurrection. You guys are singing. You're singing like you believe it. You're singing like you meant it. You can do better than that, right? Uh, Am I telling the truth? Because you were. I heard your voices. You were singing like you meant it. All right, see, some of you do, right? (laughs) Even on the audible I called today, right? That was challenging, wasn't it? But once you got it, you're like, yes. The Savior is risen. Hallelujah. What a Savior. That's That's the same thread of affection for Christ. They go in ignorance, not knowing that he is already risen discovering it, and their hearts are moved. We come in knowing it and sometimes can treat it like it's mundane, it's boring. You know what time does the game come on tonight? I mean, your thoughts are probably on all kinds of places, right? But if we can pick up that thread of affection and passion for the Lord Jesus Christ, we can see something of what happened to these women. Astonished, trembling, 
What does it all mean? So that's the affectionate visit. Next, I want you to observe the obstacles. And there are obstacles that are known and obstacles that are unknown. And so let me point them out to you. First of all is the stone. On this early morning of the first day of the week, the sun had risen. Hard to tell exactly what time of day that is, you know. Um, I doubt they had this um, daylight savings dilemma we live under. How many of you have caught up sleeping yet? But it's at sunrise, so maybe as early as 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm not, I, I, I think I'm on good ground to speculate, quite possibly even. They might not have slept very well the night before. You ever have that experience where when you're anticipating something coming the next day, you, you wake up and are ready to go, and maybe even a couple of hours before it's time to, to leave to go do that thing? That, that's, that's the kind of anticipation that's happening here because they're up very early. They've got their spices in hand and they're making their way to the tomb. And what is on their mind? Verse 3. They were saying to one another. And I, and I, think, I think if you read the text closely, you'll agree with me. They've walked. It's not that far. But they've walked some time together. And as they're getting closer to, to where the tomb is, it dawns on them. Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? I'm fear and trembling, I'm going to point this out. I'm going I'm to say this. Now, you listen carefully because I don't want to be accused of having done something untoward because I'm actually going to argue against something here. All right? Y'all with me? All right. So I was reading in Matthew Henry, 1674. I'm just trying to put him in his context. And he makes a comment, something along the lines of, these women, like women, should have thought about this before they left the house. <laughs> and I read that, and I said, no, Pastor Henry, you are wrong about that. That is a human experience that both men and women share. I cannot, I cannot tell you how many times I have left the house um, to go do a job um, in construction and uh, realize I don't have what I need to get this thing done. This is a human experience. Your mind is so focused on, a, on, on what you're going to go do, the, the project itself. We've got these spices. We've got to go and put them on Jesus' body. It never crossed their mind. It might not have crossed yours either. Well, who's going to roll the stone away? Well, that was the problem that was known. There were two others that were unknown, at least to them. They, were, they would have been unaware of this. If you read all four Gospels and put the story together, the Roman soldiers had also put a seal around this stone so that it could not be rolled away. They were afraid that his disciples were going to come and make an attempt to steal his body, and they wanted to quell that. And so they sealed it as well. And then the second unknown obstacle, they had posted a guard. And so if they had all knowledge about that, that conversation would have actually been longer and probably would not have started with the stone. would have probably started with, what are we going to say to these guards? How are we going to get them to let us into the tomb? How are they going to break? They're not going to break the seal. They're going to all lose their job. There's no way they're going to break the seal on that stone. But here's what I observe with you. Jesus had already removed them all. All the obstacles. He had already gloriously and powerfully removed them all. Now let me be very careful because the interpretation is this. The grave couldn't hold him. This is about the redeeming work of Christ. And he has done what was necessary to bring full atonement and then to let us see he didn't move the stone so he could get out. He moved the stone so that we could get in. Well, that's what it's about. That's the interpretation. This is in the history of all of God's great deeds, this is the greatest. But what might the application be? 
The application, brothers and sisters, is that he's still removing those obstacles from our life. Sometimes our faith is small, it's weak. Sometimes we're plagued by doubts. But let this be an encouragement to you this morning that as you seek to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, whether it's a financial obstacle, maybe it's a family obstacle, maybe you've desired children, maybe you've desired grandchildren, and that isn't unfolding. Maybe you wanted to retire by a certain age, and it's not happening. There's all kinds of common human wants. Maybe you didn't want cancer, but God in his wisdom has led you into this valley, this season. Maybe, maybe you didn't want the pain in your hips or your knees, but it's yours to carry. Maybe you didn't want migraines, but it's a cross God called you to carry. I think what's so beautifully encouraging is, is that this story teaches us, by way of application, he can remove those obstacles or lead us through them in such a way that they will bring him glory and honor as we worship him and witness to this greatness, this pardon he gives us through the atonement and the power he gives us for living this life under his authority. I hope you can see that and I hope you're encouraged by that. Number three, the word of the angel. So they step into the tomb. Verse five. They see what I'm sure they described to, to Peter, who later, at least um, by tradition, is the one who gave to Mark this witness of the gospel. They see a young man sitting on the right side. But then the, the, the demarcations of his angelic being, a white robe. It's only if that white robe is signifying that he is an angel, a heavenly being, that their response makes sense. They were alarmed. Now, they could have been alarmed that they thought maybe he was a danger to them. How did you get in here? But it seems more going on than that because of the conversation that ensues. And so this angel, the word itself means messenger. Um, in the book of Revelation, in the chapters 2 and 3, when it describes the churches, there is an angel of each church. And some people think that that is a veiled reference to the pastors who were leading those churches because the word means messenger. I'm going to sort all that out for you. I just want you to know that that's what this word means. They bring a word from God, a revelation from God. And that's exactly what he does. He says to them, first of all, a word of encouragement and comfort, a word of assurance. Do not be afraid. Isn't that fascinating? That's how the angels always approach, right? They, they appear, they show up, and there's something about angelic beings that is so frightening, so amazing, so astonishing, that the first words that often come out of their mouths is, do not be afraid. Don't be alarmed. Right? And that can be a comforting word faced with such a being. It's a word of assurance to them. And then the word of revelation. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified? And here it is. He has risen. He is not here. So as God's messengers, they give a word of revelation. It brings understanding. And I don't think they got it all figured out. They still got to process this. But they now have the tools to begin to process rightly, biblically, what has taken place. It really helps to put in context the Luke 24 passage we read in the road to Emmaus, right? And Jesus' response, you, you slow to believe, foolish of heart, how long, right? And then beginning with Moses, he unfolds all of the scriptures, how it was that the Christ, how the Messiah would have to die and that he would be raised again. He teaches them how this was God's movement in history. He is risen. All right, let's try it again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. You got it right. Let's try it one more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
It's a word of revelation. It changes everything. Now listen, you are the recipients of that same word today. You get to be eyewitnesses with them to this truth. Finally, it's a word of comfort. Verse 7, he says, the angel says, But go, tell his disciples. He's going to go before you to Galilee, right? Doesn't the word disciples include all 11 of them? Judas has already committed suicide. There's not the 12 anymore, and you caught that in the Luke reading, right? They went to where the 11 were. Isn't the word disciples big enough to, to, to include Peter? Isn't Peter one of the disciples? But go tell the disciples and Peter. It's a word of comfort. He had denied him on the night of his trial, fearfully before a, a servant girl and a second accuser. I'm not one of his disciples. You got me confused. You got the wrong guy. I know. Maybe I fit a profile. I'm not him. We know from the closing of the Gospel of John that Jesus engages in a restoration of Peter. What a word of comfort. Look, we're all sinners in this room. There are no perfect people that make up God's church. We've got to have a lot of patience with one another, a lot of grace for one another. Peter's restoration is helpful to understand our own restoration. Look, we are all like Peter. Even as I'm preaching this morning, like a lot of thoughts that I'm sharing with you, they're not even my own. Like I didn't come up with them. I read, I read them in, in books that help, prayed over them. Lord, what would you want me to share? What would you want me not to share? Help me, Lord, to communicate the things that need to be shared. And, and I have no qualms about telling you that. Like, I don't think I have to be innovative or new as a pastor. Because all I am at the end of the day is one beggar telling other beggars where to go find bread. We're in this walk home together. And Peter, this is not just a word of comfort to him, but it's also a word of comfort to us. Sort of from the, the greater to the lesser. If he can restore Peter who was a disciple who walked with him for three years, who heard his sermons in person, right? If, and then he denies him. If he can restore him, how much more so can he restore you? And the word of the angel not to be afraid rings in our ears like the word from Joshua. For we receive a pardon from Christ, our sins forgiven in Christ. I pray that you... In an embrace of faith, reach out to him in that way this morning to find forgiveness of your sins. But it's also a word of power to us that we would be able to walk in that forgiveness and that grace. And so Joshua reminds us not to fear. There should be no fear because all those who come to Christ, who come to him, they will be received. They will not be turned away. And this ought to give us great confidence, as the writer of Hebrews says, to approach the throne of grace in boldness. And this is what Joshua says. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And so, brothers and sisters, the final point, the assignment. And this is also the conclusion. We've seen the affectionate visit. We have observed the obstacles, known and unknown. We've heard the word of the messenger from God. A word of revelation, a word of assurance, and a word of comfort. That word of comfort that leads to no longer fearing. I pray you'll receive the assignment. Verse 7, but go. Tell his disciples. Go and tell. We're going to sing a hymn in just a few minutes. Grace unmeasured. It's a song that celebrates our pardon and the power. Sins forgiven, presence of God through the Holy Spirit in your life to walk with you, to get you home safely. The resurrection secures both of these divine blessings. 
like the women and men of the early church whom we've just read about, may we be marked also by worship and by witness. Worship of God in Christ. It is the fuel for that witness. Just to go out and be a witness without also being a worshiper, it's kind of a fool's errand. To be a worshiper with nowhere for that to go in the world, and we, we tell God, but we're so infected, we're so filled up, it becomes fuel then for serving others, loving others, and communicating to them in words this glorious message. Brothers and sisters, this is the assignment. You can see it. One last thing. Just observe. If you know anything about the New Testament, you know as the Gospels come to a close, the apostles get busy planting churches, taking the Gospel in word and deed around the world. We continue that work this day, and we're able to do it because of the truth and the power of the resurrection. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask this morning that as we have heard your word, been nourished by it, that the grace, an unmeasurable grace that has come through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, his ascension to your right hand where he makes intercession for us day by day, Lord, that this unmeasurable grace will be poured out into our life, both as pardon and as by power, that we might bring honor and glory to your name. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.